Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Liebeck from uh, Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, 506 Infantry, Vietnam, 1970. Today, uh, we are interviewing Jim Martin, Jim Pee Wee Martin. This 30-minute segment will be on Market Garden. Jim was in G Company, 3rd Battalion, 506, from Tokoa all the way to the end of the year. Uh, I I'll lay the groundwork on Market Garden. Uh, in uh, September 1944, General Montgomery had the, conceived of an uh, airborne operation to seize a road leading from the Allied lines up through Holland up to the Arnhem Bridge. And the idea was for three um, airborne divisions to seize this road, make way for a British armored corps to run up the road, cross at Arnhem, and make a run through the Ruhr and try to hit Berlin and end the war before the end of 1944. The road was a very narrow road with lowlands on each side, barely suitable for armored vehicles. The uh, 101st Airborne was to seize the first one-third of the road and hold it, the 82nd Airborne for the second one-third of the road, and finally, at the end of the road, the last one-third, and the all-important Arnhem Bridge uh, was to be taken by the 1st British Airborne Division, supplemented with a Polish Airborne Brigade. Um, so that gives you the whole concept of Operation Market Garden. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Jim Martin, and he will describe his experiences with G Company, 3rd of the 506. Okay, Jim, your outfit came back from uh, Normandy on July the 10th, uh, back to England, back to Ramsbury, where 3rd Battalion was billeted. Just briefly describe, uh, I know this is a long time ago, but briefly describe what did you do for that two-month gap between when you came back from Normandy and prior to September 17th when you jumped into Holland. What kind of training did they have you do? Regular training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and of course, everybody complained about it, said, look, we didn't so, need any training. We've already been in combat, but it was valuable. And our unit particularly, the 506, Saints took German prisoners and put them in their uniforms and gave them their weapons. And then we played offense and defense against them. So we had a, a real wake-up call there as to how those things operated and the Germans operated and all of that. So you were wargaming in the uh, English countryside between Normandy and Market Garden? We went right back with training, yes. Okay, okay. All right, so this is most of July and, of course, all of August and then the, the first part of September. It's my understanding that Market Garden was put together in relative haste. They didn't have a long time to plan it. Um, how much in advance were you guys told you're going to jump into Holland? How many days of preparation uh, did, you, did you have for that? Well, I don't think we had more than a week or so to just get, get ready and go, because mm -hmm. we were always ready. Mm -hmm. We stayed ready. Mm -hmm. But... <clears throat> They said it was a failure. Let's, let, let's uh, talk about the summation uh, uh, towards the end. Um, okay, you get on the airplane, you take off, you get on the C-47, you take off. Um, how long of a flight bet from Exeter over to, to Holland? Do you recall? About two hours. A, a couple hours? Okay. Talk about the jump itself. I've heard you talk about this many times. In particular, what, what are you thinking? As far as, was it a difficult jump, or was it like a parade oh, ground no. jump? It was, it, was it was a Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. uh, bright sunshine, mm -hmm. people just coming home from church, and uh, we jumped at 800 to 1,000 feet mm -hmm. because there's no firing on us. Mm -hmm. uh, a parade jump. Okay. And where did you land? Um, I can't tell you what... How and I landed at, I think it was near Grava. Okay, okay. Uh, <clears throat> was it Son? Did you come down oh, near no, Son? I landed at Son, that's right. 
And then mm -hmm. I, I got wounded and I went out at Grava. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, you hit the ground. I think you landed in a field outside of Son. Uh, tell us what happened. I know you have kind of a comical story well, about what happened. Well, there was happened. a little store there. And I went in there, and he had a cheese hanging outside a sign. And I liked cheese, so I went in and had a big round of what looked like American cheese. And I pointed to it, and he cut a big piece off for me. And I held out some of my ham with evasion money, and he said, no, 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 no. He wouldn't take any money for it. Mm -hmm. And as long after the war went up back, I met that guy again. What was the 3rd Battalion objective once you were on the ground in the Netherlands? We were supposed to take that big bridge. In, in Eindhoven? Yes. Right. Well, our first thing was Eindhoven, and then that's a funny thing too. We landed not at Eindhoven, but we had to backtrack a few miles to get to Eindhoven. And then the next morning, well, in the meantime, that bridge across there, they blew, they blew it. And of course, uh, second battalion was ahead of us and all those timbers coming down, a lot of guys got hit by that stuff. Mm -hmm. Went into Eindhoven and there was two 88s and they got one 88 boar siding right down the street. People were out giving people fruit and, and drinks and things, and that thing would fire and everybody would run inside and then they'd come back out and we're trying to, our guys trying to fight. Now our second battalion, our second, uh, uh, our unit, second platoon was pulled out for security that night at a girls' school. And then the next day we went, they put some planks across and we went into Eindhoven. And that's when things happened that shouldn't have. And we were said right away before we went in there, no matter what you see done, don't you say anything or stop anything. And what they did, they, the girls who had consorted with the German officers, they shaved their heads, and pulled their clothes off. A couple of them were carrying babies and they made them run through a, a line of people and, and beating them as they went through. You saw this? Oh, absolutely, and I was outraged about it. And some of the civilians said, well, you don't know what it's like to live under that and here these girls were going with the Germans. And I told everybody, I said, you got to understand, that German came in there, if he wanted a girl, he took her. Some went willingly because they knew they could get food and get taken care of. But our officers had a hard time keeping us from doing it because everybody wanted to go in and, and stop that. And I still say it was wrong. Mm -hmm. But you know, who the hell was I to say? Yeah. Um, okay, as the, as the operation progressed, um, when did it become apparent to the guys in your outfit, in your, you know, in your uh, battalion, in your company, that things were falling behind schedule? Did, did, when did you become aware of that? Well, in the first eight or ten days, our officers had control of us. And after that, then, uh, Montgomery had it. Mm -hmm. Now, remember this. He had, McGurray had been on Eisenhower for months. And this is a road that's 60 miles long through enemy territory. To me, that's unconscionable because you're taking troops, not our troops, we walk, but troops up to the battlefield and bringing wounded and dead back, taking supplies out. And here the Germans, and we're supposed to keep a, a corridor open a mile and a half on each side of this road. And that was our job to do. And the Germans would hit us, and we'd run up there and it'd take you maybe an hour, hour and a half to clear the Germans out. In the meantime, the convoy has stopped. 
people are getting off taking a leak. The British people are, or the, these other civilians there were setting up with little things and making tea and coffee and stuff. Some going in civilian homes. In one case, there was a, a tank outfit sitting there and one of our officers went over and said, what are you guys doing? They said, waiting on our officer. As far as he's, he's in there having breakfast with some woman. And he went in there and told him, he said, get your ass out there right now. And he said, when I finished breakfast and he pointed his gun and he said, you're going out now. And he did. And anyway, those people are across the darn room. The British had put 10,000 airborne troops across the river. They were told that they would get relief in no later than three days. Now Dempsey was supposed to be in charge. Montgomery was his boss, but he, he just cut Dempsey clear out of it and took it over. And he didn't start up there for four or five days. In the meantime, the Germans, that gave them plenty of time to do what they were going to do. And we were also told that all of us over there was old men and young boys. Well, we found out that wasn't true either. And then this British officer that was the intelligence officer over the whole thing, he kept doing the wrong thing and saying the wrong thing. And they, as I told you, they relieved him and sent him home and let him be a big hero. <coughs> but in the meantime, as the British pulled out and we pulled in, they told us that night, it's a quiet sector. Well, it had been a quiet sector. But when we went in the next day, it was more shelling than we'd seen in a long, long time. And uh, you can read about how bad it was. And of course, I was wounded in about the 10th day, and then I went out. Talk a little bit about your wounding. What happened? About what? Talk about your wounding. What what happened? Well, <coughs> there was some blood. Well, how, how did you blood. get hit? What but happened? It was thought to be worse than it turned out to be, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I was lucky I had boots on because it hit on the side of the boot, and that kept it from actually penetrating very much. Now, I limped for about a year afterward, but, uh, and of course I was upset because I had to be taken out too, because nobody wants to be taken out. No, believe it or not, people do not want to leave. They want to stay there and do what they're going to do, and I was no different. So this was shrapnel from shelling? Yeah. Is that what hit you? Well, it could have been, it could have been a gun, it could have been from a bomb that was dropped, whatever, we don't know. But when you're in those situations and all these things are going on, there's lots of metal flying around. Everybody gets it. Uh, many of our guys are carrying stuff in their body now, stuff that didn't come out for 20, 30 years later. One guy had some stuff come out about 10 years ago next to his heart, and it was metal. There's one guy that's got it right next to his spine. They say that he can't take it out because it might cut his spine. So those things happen too. So you were evacuated from Grav? Yeah. And then where did you go after that? Where did they... I went to a, a place in Gent, G-E-N-T, Belgium. Uh, Ghent, Belgium, okay. Yeah, about okay. 200 miles away. Mm -hmm. And how long were you there, do you recall? Oh, I was there about a month. Okay. And there's some other guys there, and there's one guy that had a had his shoulder messed up and he had a big cast on his hand up in there like that. That damn fool jumped the fence and went to town at night and got drunk. Can you imagine that? And then because me, I teamed up with a guy, a British guy, a gunner, and we got to be real good friends. And when we got out of there, we went to a replacement depot and that's Litchfield. And then those guys were ahead of it, killed people, and they went to prison. But uh, he and I, uh, Fred Anstone was his name, he was Gunner Fred Anstone, and uh, he and his 
girlfriend and I spent about a week together after we got out of Litchfield. Mm -hmm. And then after the war, I uh, wrote a letter and never got an answer, so I assume he must have been killed. Mm. And after you left uh, Ghent, Belgium, where did you go next? Uh, uh, Sarancester, England. Okay, so back to England. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then when from England did you go to Mormolan? Because I know you were there later um, on. <clears throat> I went to hospital in Paris. Mm. And then I met Ramsey there. She was in charge of all the Red Cross bureaus there. And uh, then uh, I went to Sarancester and got out of there. And, and then uh, I went back to my unit. And there was nobody there except new guys. And I said, where are the guys? And they said, well, they're up at, uh, oh, you know, north of there. And I said, well, when are we going up there? And he said, no, you're not. You're going to stay here and train with us. And I didn't think much of that idea because here, this guy had never been in combat and he's going to train us. And so I went down to the airfield and there was a, a train of C-47s coming over with supplies. And then it, they were buying cheap gin in England and selling it to France. They had an arrangement with somebody over there. And then they were taking cheap wine from there and taking over to England. And so I said to the crew chief, how about it? taking a couple of us to England. And he said, uh, well, I'll see my pilot. If you come down here to, next, tomorrow, how many things will be going? I said, about, there'll be four of us. So I went down the next day and he said, yeah, we can take you back. And they dropped us at a place called, uh, oh, I can't remember. It's right outside of England a ways. And it's a, uh, a British base, but there are also Americans there. And we went into the, the guy said, well, now we're over here, what the hell are we gonna do for money? I said, we're gonna go in and find a finance officer. So we, I found, a, asked somebody, an American finance officer, and we walked in there and he said, well, who in the hell are you guys? And I told him, and he said, what do you want? I said, I'd like to have a partial pay. He said, well, hell, this, we're an Air Force. We can't give you any money. I said, you go look at your book. We, and we always carried our pay book. That's, we had to do that. And he said, no. I said, go look at your damn book. And he did. And he said, yeah, you're right. And he said, how much you want? I said, oh, give us about three pounds a piece. I said, we've got places to stay in, in back where we're based. And we don't need any money. So I went back there. And it was, Troxfields where we got off the plane and all these new guys were coming over and then it took then took the jump training in the states they were not jump training yet and hell there was three times as many people as they had places to stand they were sleeping in the latrines and under the beds and and I went to the sergeant in charge and I said you can't do bed checks here can you he said hell no I said, I want to tell you something. We're going back to Ramsbury. It was about five miles away. I said, if anything comes up, you send somebody down to get us. Well, we were there about a week. And a guy come in and said, they're getting on trucks to go. So we ran up and got on trucks and went down there. And, and we got on a, um, a ship and went back, got in with our unit and went down to the found out where we were. We were living in tents that had a big wooden thing and a, a tent with about 20 guys in it. And uh, the captain said, uh, where in the hell have you been? And I wasn't going to lie because hell, he, he'd catch up. And then I told him what we'd done. He said, am I going to hear about it? And I said, no, you're covered. He said, go back and check with the the sergeant and get your stuff and fall in with the guys and that's how that happened mm -hmm. so uh, so you were in on the operation for like eight to ten days before you got hit by uh, some kind of shrapnel and that's the first time i saw flamethrowers 
the Germans were using flamethrowers. Talk about that. What what was going on? Well, when I saw a British officer, that you could have cut stakes off and ate him. He was burnt that badly. I mean, they shouldn't even allow that kind of thing. But uh, I said, I don't think I'm too bad anyway. And they said, doesn't matter, you're going out. And that was the way it was. Uh -huh. And then, of course, you're supposed to have 20, year, 20 days of combat before you get the combat interest of bad. And they were ignoring that. And the guys that got killed the first day got it too. And some people complained. And I said, look, I don't care if he came in one day or, and didn't do a damn thing. He was there and he got killed. And damn it, that's the way it should be. So then they, they abandoned that. And everybody that got hurt or killed got the combat infantry badge. And everybody wanted that. And officers tried to get it that weren't in combat. And, and they, they turned them down. And they should have. Was it in Holland that you had the encounter with uh, General Taylor? Was that in Holland with General Taylor? S somebody told him to, yeah. to dig his own foxhole or something? Talk about no, that. No, that was in Normandy. Oh, that was in Normandy. Okay. Uh, okay. See, and I told you, we were... We were pulled out, my platoon pulled out for security there. And there was a girls' school, and that's where they set up their headquarters there. And that's where I met him, and then there was a, a, an old person's home there, too. And the Germans ran the old people out in the road as cover for them. And then the shelling got pretty heavy from across the river. And so we were all laying in the ditches along there, and here comes Taylor up there, walking down the middle of the damn road. A Taylor was not liked at all. He was not a people person. But he and I got to be friends after the war up until he died. But anyway, he was walking down there, and he said, what in the hell are you guys doing in the damn ditches? And he said, well, there's some machine guns shooting down here. He said, Damn it, get the hell out of there and get up on this damn road. And he walked right down the middle of that damn road. And he said, I don't ever want to walk into somebody and tell me they're tied down, can't go anyplace. We're in here to fight. And that's what you're going to do. And that's the way he was. But see, he was also bad when he came up to us in uh, Battle of Bulge. The guys hadn't shaved. He said, I want you shaved, and I want you to place up the damn bullets here. And that snow on the ground is 10 below zero. And then he said, and I don't want you to see anybody building a fire and putting their damn eggs in a helmet either. And so some sergeant said, well, now where do you want us to cook them? And he said, well, you're a mess. And then he stopped and walked away. He was going to say our mess kits, <laughs> and it didn't go that way. But for some reason, after the war, and I think you've got the book now, I uh, got to be good friends with him, and I wrote and told him I had this book that Costamacca had written, and would he, if I sent it to him, would he sign it, and I'll send money for you to send it back, and I got the letter. And he, he called me and he said, gave me an address for to send this book. And he said, in the letter he sent to me with it, when he sent it back, don't think of return postage. Mm -hmm.